Welcome back once again to the Best Wines Media Tasting Room. I'm Kyle Meyer, and uh, I've been waiting for this one for years. Let me put it to you that way. That's how tickled pink I am today to have the man uh, who's sitting next to me here uh, in our tasting room to do some splaining for us. Uh, sitting next to me is Mr. Ben Halkins. Uh, sir, what, international sales manager, would that be? Well, or, co founder. Co founder, co -founder. that's pretty director. important. Hugh Johnson and I really yeah. got this show on the ground. Okay. So, Ben and Hugh, little, another guy by the name of Hugh Johnson, you may have heard the name once or twice. Uh, ben and Hugh, uh, this is their gig, the Royal Tokai Wine Company. And, um, you know, first of all, Ben, welcome. Thank you. Yeah, nice thank to be you. Back again. A sincere Great. welcome. This is absolutely phenomenal. And we do have a lot of ground to cover, Ben. So bear with us today as we go through a few questions, a few burning questions. Sure. That, um, you know, maybe stuff that I know the answer to, but uh, the rest of the public uh, watching these doesn't know the answer to. Sure. Because I think it's very important to address these wines on multiple levels uh, so that people actually know just how special they are. I don't think the world knows how amazing true Hungarian Tokai wine is. And you're gonna explain that to us today. So um, I, first of all, I wanna start uh, with the whole term Tokai, or Toke, or Tokaji, or whatever. Yeah. It's a name that's been bandied about for centuries on multiple fronts. What exactly really is Tokai? Right, Tokai without the I, T-O-K-A-J, is the name of the town. Mm -hmm. And Tokai, T-O-K-A-J-I, is the name of the region and the district in Hungary, 200 kilometers northeast of Budapest. And it's very close to the borders of Ukraine and Slovakia. And that is where the world's first Appalachian controller classified vineyard region was conceived. So this, okay, so we talk about, you know, Burgundy and Bordeaux and all these areas as having these classifications, Barolo, Barbaresco. But in fact, Tokai was the first. And when was that? It really was the first. It was owned, the whole area was owned by Prince uh, Rakoxi II, mm -hmm. hence this royal bit here. And, uh, and uh, he reckoned that there were uh, about 25, 27 villages around, whose vineyards around we are producing better wines than anywhere else in Hungary. And so the burghers of those days went up to him and said, look, we need to be recognized. And so, difficult to say exactly, but certainly before 1700 and finalized in about 1730, that these vineyards were classified into first, second and third class growth. And at the time they were called, what was the term? Prime? Primae classes. Primae classes. Because Latin was the official language uh, in those days, and there were primi classes, secundi classes, and tertiary classes. Right. And in turn, what happened is the, the, the noblemen, royalty, etc., from, from around Europe acknowledged these already at that stage, and these were pretty popular wines at that time, right? Well, that's, that's exactly a good point, because you've just got to look at the color of these wines, and the color is that golden color, mm -hmm. and there's a certain amount of sugar in them, mm -hmm. and in those days, the, which we now know as a kind of health restorative, sugar really does help. And so these were kind of liquid gold, and these were the wines that were sort of small quantities, about 10% of the Sautern mm. whole area. And these wines were the wines that were, um, they were um, helped seduce uh, Louis XIV's mistresses. They were the wines that were put <laughs> by the Pope's bedside to help an ailing Pope. They were the wines that were given to uh, potentially impotent emperors to make them more potent, uh, and so on and so forth. So they were the wines that were bartered in, uh, for the King of Poland, so many casks of Tokai Azu uh, in return for so many soldiers to. So it really was, these were the wines, that, these were the celebration wines of the 17th and 18th century. So now you know why you need a little Tokai in your house, obviously. Exactly, <laughs> and, and just, just to not interrupt, but uh, Hugh Johnson, my learned, revered friend, uh, would, would, has gone on record as calling this particular wine here the medieval Viagra. <laughs> Go for it. Liquid gold. Okay, let's talk about grape varieties. Yeah. Because uh, Toke has been considered a grape variety in Alsace. That's not happening anymore, obviously. But at one point, there was a lot of affixing and suffixing and this kind of deal going on with this name. But in reality, what are the actual grapes that go into a Tokai wine? 
Well, that's another good point, and I'm glad to clarify that, is the three main grapes in all these wines are the ferment grape, mm -hmm. dominant, great acidity, the harsh de velu grape, uh, and the muscat grape. Mm. And so you're right, there's no actual grape called Tokai in Tokai. I think what must have happened is, hundreds of years ago, is that the, the travellers from, from, from Alsace or from Italy came to the region, liked what they saw, took away the grape variety, and without realising that it was probably the ferment or the harsh velu, called it the Tokai grape Tokai variety. Grape, yeah, yeah. And that's how it got linked into the others, other, other areas. So Ben, let's talk about, because there is one other word on these labels. Well, there's yep. a lot of words on these labels that we're not really clear with. Yep. And I, I want to know, maybe we should just cover them uh, sequentially. We have this term azu. Yes. What's this word azu? Azu, very straightforwardly, it means dried. Mm -hmm. And in, if you take it one stage further, to get a dried grape, two things have to happen. Either you've got a lot of sun, which dries the skin and the grape, or which is the key here, is to get the botrytis in, okay. which eats away the moisture, and therefore you get like dried raisins. Got it. Okay, so essentially, that's boom, dry. So we know that. Then there's this other word, putonios. Yes. Right. Is that how you say it? That is precisely how you okay. say it. And it is one of these, no, well done, it's exactly, it's one of these words that is really the second word people know after tokai and azu and, and putonios. And it's a nightmare to explain. And I can explain it very simply. It's like adding sugar lumps to a cup of coffee. Okay. The more sugar lumps you add, the sweeter the coffee is. Right. It may not be better, and the liquid doesn't expand, but it's thicker. And so Petonius was originally a hod, a wooden hod that the pickers put on their back, and when it was filled full of 40 pounds worth of azu berries, mm -hmm. picked one by one, and I mean one by one, just not one by one, then once that was filled up, they then added the, uh, the, 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 the uh, macerated azu berries into a barrel of 130 litres of dry white wine. And so the more you added, then the sweeter it became. Right. So therefore, we, when we started the company, there were three, four, five, six paternas, levels of sweetness. Now it's simply residual sugar. Mm -hmm. And what it means is three and four are sort of fading away a bit, not... We never made them, but mm -hmm. not really interesting wines. So we're five and six. So rough, so exactly, a five Petronius wine has to have a minimum of 120 grams of sugar per litre. Got it. Okay. But with the acidity, which the acidity, of course, it doesn't feel like that. Right. So, but are you still making it with those macerated azu berries? Or, Absolutely. Okay, got it. Absolutely. So you're, you almost have two different harvests. It's like you're making a wine, then you're making a wine to kind of pump up the volume of the wine. Correct, correct. So we make the dry white wine, which mm -hmm. is the ferment there. That's, that's commercially made, so, mm -hmm. it's, so it's, 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 it's ready to, to, to drink, whereas a, a rougher version mm -hmm. would be used to, uh, to, to actually be the base wine, uh, which, you, which you make as, as normally, and then, uh, and then you add the azu berries into it. So it's kind of two-tiered production process. My God. These wines are so remarkably sweet, said yet so remarkably on a razor's edge. Can I can I help myself? Yeah, well, you're your wines. Thank you. <laughs> the the definition and intensity of these wines combined with their sweetness, it's remarkable. I mean, you almost well, they they, they are unique. Um, it's a unique production method. It's not done anywhere else, and the quantities are very small, and. One of the, when I first went there, which was in 1992, um, which is not the story, but I ended up there. And the first thing I did was taste 30 different Azu uh, mm -hmm. blends from 30 different casks. And at the end of the tasting, I, I felt my mouth was completely fresh yeah. and clean. And I thought, this has never happened to me anywhere else in the world. After tasting 30 different wines from yeah. 30 different casks, you know, your mouth is all because they're young wines by definition. Yeah. And that, that got me hooked. And, um, and, and again, it's, luckily, it's a wine that we've rediscovered, which is right for today's marketplace. Yeah. It's low in alcohol, it's 10 degrees, it's high in acidity, it's got lots of fresh fruit, and it's mm. got that perfect balance that we need in all wines. What, what would you, in your experience, define as the flavor characteristics of a classic Tokai Azu wine, you know, in that 
five or six foot on the, this range. The, the flavor characteristics, you go back to the sort of dried apricots, white mm -hmm. peaches, honey, mm -hmm. um, and then the mahogany kind of taste when the wines get older. But I think what you, what, what you get is, is a kind of, you get a kind of waves of flavor that, that hit all the different taste buds. So you've got your sweet and sour taste buds. Uh, so they're sort of sweet and dry wines in a way. And again, that is unusual. So they are wines you can I enjoy perfectly by themselves. Like all great wines should be enjoyed yep. by themselves. And then, of course, they match perfectly with, with um, uh, aged age Gouda cheese or with classically with foie gras because foie gras is, um, and thank goodness now we're back in business in California, <laughs> um, because Hungary is the world's second biggest producer of foie gras. Most wow. of which go to France and come out wow. of foie gras. I didn't know that. So that's been so. These wines have been growing up side by side with foie gras with Hungarians yeah. for you know for centuries. This at twenty five years old is remarkable, and this is even bef like you know what I mean. This is the early days with your project. And the it's early days. So that was that was our stunning. very first vintage, nineteen ninety, and you can see how the colours uh, moved on. But again, you know, and when we were starting out, we were tasting wines of the late nineteenth century and. Um, and the freshness is still there. Mm. And, yeah. you know, it's rather like, when you get to that, it's like um, nursing in, in your glass, like an old cognac, an old yeah. armagnac, yeah. or an old tawny port. You get the same kind of feel there. Man, my nursing skills were pretty weak with this one. <laughs> there was no <laughs> nursing involved. Um, but before we go, lastly, I want to talk about the insanity that is Essencia. Because this is insanity. Insanity is a good word. Um, it is insane. When we first thought we'd, as it were, produce it and, and make it available, um, people thought we were pretty mad. Our wineries are mad, so that all made sense. <laughs> um, and I remember launching it with my friends at Wilson Daniels um, four years after, five years after we produced the first vintage. Mm. And we made all of, it was announced and everything else. Um, and I kept looking at the, at the at the Essencia uh, in its sort of glass demijohn in the cellar, and it still hadn't finished fermenting. It fermented for a further three years. Essencia takes six to eight years to finish fermenting. The residual sugar is so high that they simply can't transfer the sugar to 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 um, to alcohol. And so this little baby here is less than three degrees alcohol. It is um, about 600 grams of sugar per litre. The acidity is even double what it is in these here. And it is, what it is, is the essence of the grape. What it is, we were talking about these uh, petonios of dried berries mm -hmm. being collected. They're then taken to our winery, put into an open stainless steel tank, and then the little dribbles of, from their own weight that comes out the bottom is the essencia. So this is a drip, drip. It's a drip, 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 drip. And we're now having great fun with spoons, which we, which we uh, include in here. And a lot of restaurants are serving it by the spoon. And you need about two pounds of dried berries to produce enough to go into one tiny spoon. So it is, it's completely mad, but, but the great thing is that people are actually endorsing it in restaurants, a nice bit of theatre, yeah. and of course it's a wine you can open at home. Yeah. You could then leave it like that for your grandchildren. Really? It simply doesn't degrade? It doesn't degrade. So it is, it is um, it's quite fun to be the owners of the Essencia, and that's, you know, that's what we're bringing to market. Did you guys get all this? This is, this is one of the coolest interviews we've ever done. Um, ben, thank you. This was amazing. <laughs> if people don't have a grip on Tokai, Azu, Mad, Hungary, Drip, 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 and Liquid Gold. After this, I don't know what else we can do for them. Thank you so much for coming in and sharing your time. Well, thank you, Carl. Really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. Boom. Cheers.